Okay, Liz. Okay, um, this is the Housing First Subcommittee of the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development, and the meeting has now commenced. It is Wednesday, June 29th at 3.57 p.m. The meeting's being held virtually due to COVID-19 to allow for social distancing and protect the public health. As we continue our efforts in meeting remotely, we ask all subcommittee members and guests to meet yourself until called upon to speak to avoid feedback and background noise. For those who have dialed in using the call-in number to unmute to speak, dial star six on your phone. Also prior to speaking, please announce who you are to identify yourself. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We ask that you only use the chat, chat function to request to speak or to announce that you are leaving the meeting so that we can track quorum. Um, also in order to comply with state open meeting law attendance, the votes will be done by way of roll call using audio, not by using the chat function. Um, would anyone who is a member of the subcommittee please say their first name or roll call? Uh, Mike Edmonds. Yeah, Mike Edmonds. All right, Liz Wilson is here. You have quorum. Now is the time for a call. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Now for call to the audience. I don't see any audience members pregnant present. So um, with that being said, if any members do arrive later on in the meeting, uh, I will change that agenda item to later in the agenda. Um, next, we have a presentation from Ernesto about the um, HCD and recent changes that they've made. Yes, uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, Mike, good to see you. Um, first, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, the new 24 seven resource telephone line uh, that HCD has set up uh, with the help of um, transportation and mobility uh, to provide information uh, to residents and to uh, unsheltered residents uh, uh, with information on services and resources. Um, this comes at, uh, at the request of Tucson Mayor uh, Regina Romero and uh, Tucson City Council, that this uh, resource telephone line uh, be created. Um, and uh, it began on uh, June 1st. And uh, individuals, again, can call. And uh, for example, um, a, 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 a resident in an apartment can call and say, There's a, there is a person on the street in front of my apartment person looks in distress uh, uh, or I've just talked to a, a unsheltered person in front of my my residence and this person needs this kind of help uh, and you'll call the resource the people you can call the resource line and the person taking the call will have a list of uh, services um, programs and uh, immediate emergency services that uh, that uh, are available, depending of course on the situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a resource line for those assisting someone who needs help to connect to resources they otherwise wouldn't hear about or know about. The number is 520-791-2544. Um, uh, and the resource line of course comes in response to the increasing uh, need for uh, additional uh, services and att attention to unsheltered uh, uh, people. And the city um, uh, has been uh, trying to meet that challenge uh, as, best it's, as best it can with the funding available. Uh, you know, part of this is the, the uh, Housing First uh, uh, program uh, that the city uh, initiated uh, with uh, uh, here, as well as the Community Safety, Health, and Wellness uh, Program, uh, which are two, two, uh, two first initiatives, the first time initiatives for, for the city. Um, when a person calls, uh, the person uh, will, the information is taken and uh, uh, some, some vital information is, is recorded, uh, not necessarily uh, the name, but um, uh, uh, the, the cause uh, for the, uh, the reason for the call, the kind of service that was needed, 
Uh, and I believe also a little demographic information uh, will be recorded to give us a better sense of who's calling and why are they calling. Also would like to note that after the press release went out uh, uh, in mid-June, just a couple of weeks ago, there was an uptick uh, in calls, uh, also the result of uh, media attention uh, to the resource line. So this is one of uh, you know, several initiatives that HCD has been uh, engaged with uh, in recent, uh, recent weeks and months. Uh, and just a couple of other um, updates. Um, the city of uh, uh, HCD is looking to uh, work with a uh, Phoenix-based developer to create affordable housing, uh, single family homes in the Menlo Park and Dunbar Spring areas. Uh, that is just a process that is just beginning. Uh, there are no designs yet, but uh, HCD is working with the neighborhoods uh, on uh, these two uh, proposals. Also, mayor and council recently uh, gave the go ahead to HCD to take uh, the successful Thrive in the 05 initiative and uh, bring it to the East 29th Street corridor uh, community. Uh, that area is bordered by Alvernon on the west, Craycroft on the east, 22nd on the north, and, and Gulf Links on the south. And uh, it is a community-driven, community center initiative uh, that will spread over four years with uh, principal funding from uh, with ARPA funds from the federal government. Uh, again, to uh, replicate what has been going on in the 05, uh, in the Oracle Miracle Mile area of bringing community together, engaging with community, residents, business uh, owners, uh, and other nonprofit agencies, and uh, come up with uh, plans to, uh, to enhance and, and to bring more cohesiveness and collective energy and organization to the area. Uh, the new Thrive uh, initiative in the East 29th Street corridor will not be exactly like uh, Thrive No. 5 because we're going to follow what the residents of the 29th Street corridor would like to see, what they would like to develop. Uh, this also will give us opportunity to leverage some additional federal funds uh, around uh, choice neighborhoods. Uh, and also we're all looking to bring in uh, the, a community-based crime reduction program that uh, we have been working with uh, ASU in the Thrive in the 05. So um, there's more, of course. Uh, 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 the city recently received a light tech funding um, for its Milagro on Miracle project, which is roughly Oracle and Grant. Uh, the city currently has a, a small uh, housing facility there, uh, and the idea is to develop uh, uh, some additional properties there adjacent uh, to uh, Alturas and, uh, and Oracle. So that uh, is a very short um, report uh, on what we're doing here at HCD, Liz, and uh, 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 Tom is here on on the on the uh, meeting and as well as director morales welcome thank you so much ernesto um i have a couple of questions myself yes. uh, mm -hmm. about what you discussed but first i wanted to see if any um attendees had questions okay um, so I see the phone number. Thank you so much for doing this presentation. I am reviewing the press release, which I put in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and I see the resource telephone number. Um, can you tell me where does this phone call go to um, it, when someone makes a phone call? It goes to the city and specifically to the Department of, uh, of Transportation and, and Mobility. Uh, it is that uh, there's a, they have some call takers who are uh, taking other calls on other lines. And so we, ACD, enlisted uh, DTM to assist us in, 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 this, uh, in this project. 
So um, uh, it goes to it goes to the call takers at DTM. Thank you. And mm -hmm. um, those call takers, have they undergone any additional training on, or has there been any sort of consolidated resource list for them to refer to? Uh, yes, to both. Liz, they are. Uh, they did undergo some, some training uh, specifically to, to uh, talk, uh, to deal with uh, callers uh, reading uh, uh, homeless and unsheltered uh, issues. And they have a, a specific list of resources uh, to, to share with uh, callers. It's something that we developed here uh, with Brandy Champion uh, at HCD, the uh, Housing First uh, Director. Great. Um, and that list of resources, is there somewhere that people could access that online if say for example they only had access to the library um, for internet access and maybe not a reliable phone oh that's a good question Liz um, I don't know for sure I what, certainly... I, what I can do if Ernesto if you don't mind I'll jump no, of course in not. thank you Liz um, so what we did is we took the resources that TPCH has and we, um, so, so a lot of those resources are already online. And so um, that's, we, we kind of nailed down um, what, what were resources that could be offered, but I will tell you, it's more likely that we're just referring a lot of those calls to our outreach workers mm -hmm. to reach out to them, to be more, to get a better understanding of what the needs are. So it's, it's more about connecting them to the right place versus just providing resources. So the, to answer your question, it's already pretty much out there on the website through TPCH. Thank you. Liz. Thank you so much. Um, and then I have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know this phone number, it sounds like this is something for third parties, uh, maybe someone who sees an encampment on the side of the road to call into, or is this also for people who are living in homelessness? Oh, it's for, for, for both, Liz. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's open to anyone who um, needs to use these services. Again, uh, someone living in an apartment and sees uh, someone or talks to someone unsheltered on the street, they can call on their behalf, or an unsheltered person who uh, has this information can call. And as uh, Director Morales just mentioned, uh, they will be referred to um, our... Um, collaborative agencies and partners. Thank you and so much. Does anyone just, else? Just to clarify, Liz, this is not an emergency line. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, emergency line of 911 continues, of course. Uh, so if anyone is in uh, need of immediate attention uh, of safety and medic or medical attention, uh, 911 would be the, the, the phone line to call but not the uh, not this resource line. Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I do, just a couple. Um, for uh, Ernesto and Liz Morales, um, I don't need it or want it now, but can can I later get uh, more information about the properties that were mentioned? Um, I think there's three of them in total that I might, I might be interested in that, that Ernesto mentioned. Might be yeah. Mr. What the properties you're referring to the Milagro and Oracle? Yeah, because my the first thing, question that popped in my head is: Are there are there particular populations that those properties are going to be set up for or intended for? Um, the Miracle on Milagro, uh, Liz, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, and I I, I think I owe this to you, Mike. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got to remind me. Um, so we, what I think, what we what we want to provide to you is kind of a summary of the project and kind of what the intention of it is. That is that what you're looking at? Yeah, just Are like nothing. For? Yeah, nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing uh, sweat worthy. Just yeah, just something that. Yeah. Which I think um, we have some materials that I I told you I'd be happy to share with you just around. Uh, kind of what we and I think uh, maybe our press release might be helpful with that Ernesto we'll do. Um, to share mm -hmm. that because that does go into some detail about because I will say um, of the 63 units we have 19 units that will be supportive housing for older adults coming out of homelessness um, so that'll be and it'll have some wraparound services 
So that gives you some of that information, but um, happy to share. We have, uh, we have um, what do you call that? Renderings, kind of like really nice looking, kind of what the units will look like and how it's gonna be laid out because it's both adaptive reuse of former motor court hotel and, um, and the new construction. So it's, it, it's almost too good to not share how it looks, how, how it's planned to look. Okay, cool. And then um, Liz Wilson, I, hopefully there's no confusion, but uh, so they've got the 24 hour resource line, which is great, but I've been working with the, I don't know if you're aware of it, they call it TPD hot TPD homeless outreach team for like, if I see an encampment or something, which I've actually been working with for about a month now mm -hmm. um, with them uh, via telephone number and an email address. I think and my, and if yeah, you don't um, mind, I'm sorry, if you don't mind, I'd like to touch on if we're going talking about housing updates or city updates. Yes, please go ahead. My phone is so loud. Um, we are working on a citywide effort. Uh, Sarah Lanius is the community safety, health and wellness director, and she's um, kind of coordinating some different efforts around the broader like interdepartmental work around homelessness. Um, but we are very specifically working on how with our homeless protocol um, right now we homeless protocol is where HCD manages, for instance, all the reports of where there's encampments. Um, as the, and in the past, it was used to identify, you know, to move people on and clean up the sites. And then with COVID, we stopped moving people. Um, and instead, you know, may just target the ones that were really causing some serious health and safety issues. So mayor and council's really asked for us to kind of get better. At how do we prioritize? So TPD developed a harm assessment tool that would, uh, we'll be rolling out that we'll be looking at um, kind of assessing through a scoring how, how serious, um, you know, as far as with criminal activity, the um, what potential you know health and safety issues, and so based on the score, it could help us prioritize and and not to move people, but really to do that more so the outreach and the cleanup um, and figure out how to address the real concerning sites. But we haven't had a good process that we can share about how do we identify which encampments we start working on. And, um, and that will, of course, will include the housing outreach and engagement and trying to get people into, whether it's shelter or other housing interventions. So um, when our goal is to have a way to report that, have a, an electronic reporting of that, uh, a mechanism, and also a way to demonstrate what, what encampments we're focusing on. And, and again, not ignoring them, but just trying to use what resources we have since they're finite resources in the most strategic way. So that's some things that will be are well underway and maybe in the next two months we'll have something um, in place that we can share on how the city is approaching uh, the encampments. Thank you, Liz. That's, a, that's amazing as an update. Um, I would love to um, get an opportunity to look at that harm assessment um, whenever it's available. I am curious, is the harm assessment um, on multiple matrices, like does it impact, the, is it more so on the overall community impact or are there other aspects that are being evaluated for harm? So I've had access to see it and, and unfortunately I haven't looked at the questions. Our, our outreach team, Brandy and her team have actually done some of them. And again, right now we're not doing anything with the scores, but just trying to see consistency. How, how is it, uh, how are the scores coming out based on what people know about these sites? Um, so um, I, when, if I can and, and when it's available, I would be happy to share that. Um, but I, I'll have to get back to you on what does it what does it demonstrate? I think it's looking at the very near area, um, the surrounding area, uh, and, and the impact on that immediate neighborhood.
neighborhood. Um, and so I think that's what it is, but I, I don't have enough information to share what that looks like, but I will, I'll come the next time we meet, I'll come back with more information. Um, hopefully Brandy can come to our next meeting. She'll have, be able to speak to it better than I do. But I think it's, um, again, it's a tool not to evaluate the people, but just the, the sites and, um, and so, and it's a and it's a tool that's been used in other communities. So they did not create it, and it's um, from what I understand has some kind of validity to it. Um, but I think they're trying. The, what, what they've been doing is doing their own story to see if it matches kind of what they know, um, and, and and if they can validate that it, the scores seem to be correct based on. Um, are the city staff members who are involved with, I know this from my court days, um, orders to show cause. Um, so give me just a moment. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to look something up real quick. Sure. Well, while you do that, if it's okay, maybe I can just, since Brandy's here, if she's got a couple of minutes um, to, to fill in the blanks. Anything, any headlines, Brandy? Uh, no, not, not nothing new, except for we are working on this stuff, as Liz said. Um, we, we're just working on, you know, um, tightening up and I would say putting processes in writing. We had some already, but they're um, a little outdated, of course. Um, and so we're just working on tightening up that homeless protocol and getting um you know these prioritizations in place just because we saw some things that worked right we tried a couple of pilots we saw some things that worked, but they want a more formal process for prioritizing um these encampments so they are using an evidence-based tool um tpd actually um is providing that evidence-based tool and liz and i are working on some other stuff in the background on our end of things about the housing tools that we already have in existence in HMIS. So this is just a really like hyper, they're really hyper focused right now on um, the homeless protocol, of course, because our homeless issues in Tucson are um, just getting bigger. They're, they're, they're huge and we don't have a lot of resources to, um, you know, we don't have the resources to, to and, and we're figuring that out. Um, so, I think that we're just trying to best prioritize everything and um, get things in a workable, streamlined process here. So, yeah, that's, that's what I was afraid of because when I've been having conversations with people, I tell them, and I don't know, I don't know all the facts, but I tell them, I said, I my perception is there's not enough resources, and you telling me <laughs> now tells me, yeah, I'm seeing oh. what I think I'm seeing. Yeah, well, and and you know, people come here. Uh, Mike, because it's warm weather, it's, you know what I mean? They, they might tend to migrate here and um, we are actually, believe it or not, a, a resource rich community as far as housing, um, you know, resources that you can get food boxes, things like that, just services period. Mm -hmm. And they tend to migrate here, whereas, you know, in the bigger cities, it's a little spread out and resources are um, not readily available. So I think people hear things, you know, about this community and they come here hoping to capitalize on some of those resources. So um, I think that's part of it. I think we're figuring it out. I mean, okay. it would be nice if we had an endless supply of money and could just buy hotels and turn them all into permanent supportive housing, but uh, we don't have an endless supply. So that's what I was going to say. That's the conversation I want to have with you over a bad cup of coffee later. <laughs> okay. who, who do we, who's got deep pockets and how do we get our hands into them? Well, that's the question we all want answered, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Brandy. Um, Liz, the, the, what I was referring to um, was city code inspectors. Are they going to be involved at all in the process of looking at these encampments? So I don't believe so, um, and, and, and I should have started by saying, I'm kind of giving you guys some, a preview of some of the work we're doing. Um, it's not really widely known, some of these tools. Um, so 
you guys kind of get, uh, that's why it's important for, for you guys to ask those questions. So to help us through the process, but uh, it's not like it's secretive, but I would just ask that you guys kind of keep this information um, and we'll keep rolling it out to you, but I really don't want it widely spread about the work this work because it could change if mayor council finds out, hey, we don't like what you're doing. But long story short, code does uh, only helps us on the sense of when it's private property and it's um, there's encampments on private property. So we will send it to code and then they'll address it with the property owners. That's how code is involved. And Brandy, am I saying that correctly? I believe that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. This is right. It's it's when the private property we have to get code enforcement because we'll. I mean, there's so many rules around the way that an encampment is removed, um, and that I don't think the community at large understands. Like, there's a process that you legally have to go through so that we're not liable, right? The 72-hour notice, the the intensive outreach, right? That has to happen. The alternatives, you know what I mean, to just displacing the, the camp, the private property code enforcement laws, you know, who can do the cleanup and who can't, you know, ES, um, Environmental Services has different equipment and does DTM, because you're talking about box culverts and washes versus up on the street and up on the, the, the top of the wash, right? So I, it's just a lot of moving parts and many different um, departments involved. And, you know, HCD has been handling this for years by itself and kind of just, um, so I think that's why there's so many players at the table now and, and trying to do things. What we're seeing on those assessments, what we're planning on the assessment is it could be done either by the TPD hot team or our, our HCD outreach teams um, is kind of the plan on who's doing the assessment. So no, the code enforcement's not like one of those that is involved on the assessment side. But we, but for instance, the other departments we will pull in is when we do identify on cleanup. And again, cleanup does not mean that we necessarily move the encampment, but it could be that it's we just need some, some efforts to go in and clean um, due to a lot of you know trash or debris. So um, yeah, I think that answers what you asked. Thank you all so much for giving us those updates for um, with HCD. Uh, the next item on the agenda, which I'm gonna go ahead and just copy and paste the agenda so that everyone has access to it. It is in the chat now, um, is for us to review um, the subcommittee goals. Um, I just posted a link in the chat as well. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so about a year ago, it looks like um, we adopted a series of um, goals for the commission itself, as well as um, the subcommittee goals. And they were submitted and I believe accepted by mayor and council. Liz, if I'm incorrect on that, please let me know. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just review uh, the full commission goals and then the uh, what was once permanent and supportive housing subcommittee goals now called housing first. Um, so the full commission's goals are to develop and preserve affordability for all Tucsonans, including renters, homeowners, and those without housing, to protect barrios and communities from rapid change and displacement, as well as structural disinvestment, to cultivate landlords and developers and partners in providing equitable, accessible, and quality housing. And the um, Permanent Supportive Housing Subcommittee identified a goal of providing recommendations on policies to increase slash accelerate available permanent and supportive housing. And that was identified as both short-term and long-term goals. Now I wanted to see if there were any particular topics that um, subcommittee members wanted to begin addressing in order to um, support this goal and even expand on it. Um, 
just real quick, Liz, uh, and I know how this is going to sound, but it's the truth. I got confused in another meeting I was in because I was looking at this exact document. We are the, the permanent supportive housing subcommittee, also known as Housing First, right? We Yeah, we changed to Housing First, I think, like the second meeting, the first meeting that we had, the second meeting that we had, something to that effect. And so that's part of the reason why I wanted to address this document is because, I mean, our subcommittee's name has changed. Um, and we really have only had an opportunity to start meeting a little bit more recently. Um, and it's been a year since we drafted this document. So I'm just curious if anyone sees any opportunity for us to develop these goals further. Uh, the only thoughts I've really had on it, and I have tried to think about, because uh, you mentioned it in the, in the, the last meeting we had, um, my mind goes to, to three phases, if you will, um, you know, shelter, housing, and then to what I would consider home. Um, maybe that's, that's not the proper way for me to, to think of it in this subcommittee, but I was wondering if, if that is how we should look at the housing first issue uh, for this subcommittee. Do you agree with me, Liz, or, or no? Yeah, I mean, I do agree with you. Um, I would love it if we divided our meetings um, by those three topics and mm. just acknowledge whether we were going to be addressing that topic in each meeting. Um, I am curious, you know, at a recent meeting, um, I didn't quite catch what was said, but I know that Joe had asked um, Liz Morales about the commission's uh, place in making rec recommendations to mayor and council. Um, and I'm just curious, Liz, if you recall that. And I, like I said, I didn't catch what you said um, at that meeting, but um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I apologize. I'm in the car. I think I got most of what you said, but if I missed something. So on the, on, I know there was one recommendation that went, for instance, on the housing affordability strategic uh, plan for Tucson, um, which was around the permanent supportive housing piece and that came from this committee. And that was a, you know, adopted by mayor and council from, from this committee's recommendation. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, I do appreciate that the, the title of this, the name of this committee was broadened a little bit more around housing first, because we know that housing is the solution for homelessness, for people who are unsheltered, but often it doesn't necessarily go as much as we'd love to put people straight into housing, that's not always uh, available. So really looking at what recommendations that can be made on how to best address the needs of our community through housing first approach, um, I think is the role of this committee that, you know, looking at best practices, you know, um, and that's why I'm so glad Brandy's here because she can help share where, what she's doing, the challenges they're facing and, and, and allow you guys to offer some, some ideas and recommendations that would help further this work. Thank you, Liz. Um, so what, I'm, I'm just getting a Word document going. So um, what I have so far is the EA emergency shelter to, to housing to home pipeline, if you will. Um, and then I have community, community needs regarding housing first. Um, because all of the funding is, um, basically received by the, by the city and then contracted out to um, sub grantees. I think that also having a close relationship with um, city of Tucson uh, contracts, housing first um, and HMIS is really important. Um, and hearing directly from them on recommendations that we can present to the full commission. Well, you do that. I'm going to jump in here real quick, and and I don't know if you can see Liz, but uh, I think we have a hand raised. But uh, let me just say this real quick, um, and we can chat about this later. But and I'd like to have Brandy in on this conversation later if if we do talk about it. You you put in your document emergency shelter, and I'm a little concerned about 
limiting it with that word emergency only because I've talked to various types of people and I'd rather see it like shelter to housing to home if that's okay with you. Oh yeah, the only reason I put emergency shelter is because that's how the federal um, funding is written out. Is oh. it, 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 that's the only reason, but I'll, I can change it to shelter. I just also am trying to very quickly. Um, Tom, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, if anyone can can talk about how this work um, connects to equity. Or does it? I'm a, I'm a little. There's this kind of commission on equitable housing and development, and I think I came in assuming that that this was recommendations around equity and equitable access. But I'm. I think I might have. I bet you won't. <laughs> so I just want to make sure or clarify. Yeah, no worries. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the question is how did these goals tie to equity, or um, was the question regarding the subcommittee itself in some other way. Yeah, I mean, generally, so we're a subcommittee of the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development. And so if we're saying we're provide recommendations on policies, it, it is policies that address inequity? Or is it assumed that that anything we, ex that's what I'm lost on. Are we looking at policies like so? Not too long ago, TPCH had done a, their diversity, inclusion, and equity group had done some sort of a evaluation of housing options for people based upon um, race and ethnicity and kind of put that report out and talked about who seemed to have access to different types of housing and shelter and were unsheltered. Does, does that information inform policy recommendations about how to try and deal with those inequities or how to address that? Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, I really appreciate that. And you're right that uh, just because for me, mentally, equity <laughs> is, um, it, you know, intrinsically tied to this doesn't mean that we're um, doing a good job of stating it explicitly, especially in regards to our goals. So um, I Something that Austin Puka mentioned to us previously was wanting our input and participation in the PCHIP plan. Um, so perhaps something um, that is a short and long-term goal, especially as it relates to relationships with City of Tucson staff, can be um, uh, reviewing uh, new studies related to um, DEI. Um, and then also something that I mentioned at a previous meeting is that I very much would like for um, this subcommittee to be a space for program participants um, to be able to share their experiences. Um, and if anyone happens to know of any program participants, please um, connect them directly to me. I'll put my email in the chat um, so that we can um, be sure to get those individuals um, invites to our meetings. And I have contacted a couple of people that I know from housing programs um, and haven't heard back. Uh, so if you know anyone, please um, send them our way. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that, that showed up that would warrant probably further exploration in that committee, that DEI group with TPCH was like, you know, what what percentage of folks make it from shelter into permanent housing with a subsidy? And you can see these variances between if you're a person of color, you're less likely to make it out of shelter and into permanent housing. So are there policy changes that we should be making, uh, recommending so to, to address that? Um, is that really what it's saying? I mean, it might need a little more research because, uh, you know, some looking into, but but are there policy recommendations or changes related to equitable access to housing? That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm gonna try and, do you have any contact information for uh, the presenter on that group? Cause... Oh yeah, yeah, I can send that out. That was the, um, the, the DEI committee, uh, racial, 
the Act, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of TPCH. Uh, but I can send out this report they had done. Um, and I don't think it's the last word on it, but I think it, it shows some potential issues. I mean, the other thing we see is a really high incidence of uh, Native American folks who are unsheltered that don't make it into shelter and certainly don't make it into permanent housing. So are there strategies that we could be doing to to engage people and how do we engage people that would would address that? But. Uh, that has caught my interest, Tom. I'd like to hear more about that later. Well, maybe I should. Um, I don't have a link to it. I just have the report. But if, if everyone's on this email, I'd be more than happy to send that report out. But, but we've seen that, you know, for many years that uh, Native Americans were much more likely to be in the unsheltered population. Um, you know, there's some hypotheses about why that might be, but a lot of the shelters historically had been not allowing people in who had been drinking. And you may be seeing a higher incidence of alcoholism among Native Americans who are street homeless. So maybe that's why they were more likely to be unsheltered. Um, but that that's a real big guess, <laughs> you know, on my part, that's a, could be totally wrong. Thank you so much, Tom. And when I receive that report, I'll contact the um, person who drafted and published it to see if they can present at one of our meetings. Um, sure, I personally am <laughs> I personally am a data oriented person. Um, and so it, that definitely is going to be something that I have a preference for. Um, but I want to be sure that we're not um, too far in one direction or another. So I'm going to go ahead and start writing out um, these goals. And if anyone has any corrections to make or suggestions, please go ahead and say something. Um, don't worry about raising your word other than processes that you would uh, experience Is there anything missing from that, do you think, or that should be expanded on? So run it by me again real quick. So I have here, is it not visible? Oh, no, it's not, but that's okay. I just feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just put this in the chat. I thought it was visible. That's cool. my mistake. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> While typing this out, thinking you can see what I'm typing. I think like Tom, like Tom mentioned, um, just a final goal uh, to include equity. More explicitly that is. Okay, can I get a motion to um, 
present this to the full commission as our new housing first goal. I so move. All right, there being no objection. Motion passes, thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen as soon as I figure out how to do that. Did I stop? Not yet. <gasps> no. Oh, there we go. I put a link to the DEI committee on TPCH in there if you want to look for, for more materials, but I still will also send, I don't see the, that report in here, so I will send that also. But it has all Amazing. the members Thank you. and who's in it and all that. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, so the next topic on the agenda is to discuss um, subcommittee membership and recruiting. At this time, we haven't really nailed down um, solid membership other than the commission members. Um, if anyone has any recommendations on um, outside uh, members of the community to participate in the subcommittee, or if they would like to um, be an official member of the subcommittee, please let us know. Liz, can I drop in here for a moment, um, Ernesto? Sure thing. Mm -hmm. um, Liz, uh, HCD will um, will go to City Council next month uh, to request that uh, one that the the full commission, um, which uh, is sunsets next month, uh, that it be uh, given an additional forty eight months, and in in addition to that. Uh, HCD is requesting Mayor and Council to approve uh, the conversion of five um, ex officio members to full voting members of the commission uh, with, uh, with, with the goal in mind of um, having um, more commissioners uh, participate in the subcommittees. Thank you, Ernesto. And mm -hmm. for the subcommittees, do we have any sort of process for subcommittee membership? Um, like if a member of the public or uh, a nonprofit partner wanted to mm -hmm. participate in the subcommittee? Liz, I don't know, but I certainly will find out. Um, awesome. Thank you. So let's what, go what ahead the, and table that. that. Okay. We'll go ahead and table that agenda item until our next meeting, if there's no objection to that. Um, and then the next agenda item is our next steps. Um, so I'm really glad that we did these goals. Does anyone have any specific items that they'd like to see on future agendas? I got an idea. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where they are in this situation. Uh, are you familiar with the homing project, Liz? So, do you want to do a brief overview of what it is? Yeah, their their, their website uh, is thehomingproject.org. Um, they seem to be uh, uh, seeking uh, some land, about nine acres of land, uh, to put up some uh, somewhat stable housing, uh, quick, tiny homes. So you, you put them up, you break them down. Um, and uh, this is a project that may have been... Uh, uh, instituted in 55 other cities across the country. Uh, they're looking towards doing something um, substantial, I guess, with the city of Tucson by November this year. Um, and uh, I was wondering if maybe um, we could reach out to them. And it doesn't have to be a long presentation, maybe get a quick presentation. I think they're, they're pitching mayor and council uh, about a, a project as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I see that their email address is right on the front of their homepage. Um, so I'm happy to email them and um, we'll go ahead and try and get a hold of them. I will say I have tried to contact a couple of developers for projects and um, they're not responding to me. It could definitely be that it's the summer, um, but I've been contacting developers um, nationally to try and talk about some more of the, some of the more innovative projects similar to this one. I'm not hearing back. Um, so if we do have success in getting a response, um, they'll absolutely be on the agenda. Yeah. 
Um, Mindy, who couldn't be here today, does want to um, have a presentation from one of the shelters in Utah. She contacted me, I think yesterday, and said that she's still working on um, getting the ball rolling on that. Mm -hmm. And while we've got Brandy's here, at least I've got Brandy's here for the moment. Again, uh, this mm -hmm. is for later, Brandy. If uh, you think it might be something worth uh, discussing or getting more information on, um, I'm interested in knowing about vacant lots, the possibilities of maybe putting them to use and, and abandoned buildings. Um, I've been doing some readings for the, what it's worth on opportunity zones. I don't necessarily think they apply to housing, but I don't see why they shouldn't. Uh, so those, those are my thoughts. Can I, can I step in real quick, Brandy, um, which is that uh, I am in conversation with Corin Manning um, to get a presentation on um, the uh, city planning and uh, zoning specifically for those um, vacant lots and abandoned buildings, as well as up conversations on up zoning and other oppor opportunities for um, denser development. Or what, I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said, Liz? Denser development. Mm. Okay. Um, I, um, I'm not sure exactly what, I, I know, I know that, I don't know if you all know this, but we are, and I'm sure Tom's heard of it, of the lady that's um, getting ready to do some um, pallet houses. It's a pilot with the pallet houses. Um, and we'll see how that goes. I mean, I think that we're, our hesitation around any kind of sanction is because it's not a humane resolution. Um, I think that that will, we'll continue talking about that. I know that there's been some movement on 1581 um, around the things that we don't like about it, right, Tom, if I'm correct, um, like the criminalization of homelessness. Um, but we'll see where that goes. I, I don't know that mayor and council, well, the mayor specifically, will jump on um, any kind of like sanctioned homeless encampment type of thing because of the inhumanity of it. So, I mean, I think the pallet homes will be interesting to watch um, because surprisingly enough, Liz Morales and I met with um, Elizabeth that does the pallet um, homes and there's some stipulations around getting them to come out and install those pallet homes. You have to have a lot of things in place for them to even agree to come, even though you're paying for them to agree to come and put them out. Um, so it's quite interesting. I mean, they, there, there's some case management has to be happening. Um, there, there's, you know, you have to have a lot of things, checks and balances in place before they're just going to come erect a bunch of, Pallet shelters, which I appreciate. Um, I, I think all of that's important. So it's interesting the things that the community is doing. Um, yeah, I'm some... just trying to get people off the street. That's it. And, yeah. I, and I, I know there's more to it than that. I understand that. I'm, but, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I just think that um, we, you know, I've been watching a lot of coverage about um, some of these sanctioned homeless and or, condoned, let's say, homeless encampments in other bigger cities and the nightmare that it's become because um, it's draining resources, police resources that are already limited and um, things like that. I can only imagine, um, you know, that those things can turn into an open air drug market. Other things can happen. Um, we, I mean, even in a low barrier shelter, and Tom will probably attest to this, we have to be very um, not uh, restrictive, but vigilant, right? It's not only, it, it's a low barrier, but that doesn't mean that nobody has any responsibility either. We, we have to be, you know, checking rooms to make sure that nobody's ODing. We have to be, um, you know, uh, um, you know, checking in on people to make sure they're not hoarding, making sure that our buildings aren't getting torn down, um, all, all various and sundry stuff. So I, I just think that even even organizations like Old Public Community Services, which is, is open to about everything, is very, very hesitant around any kind of sanctioned encampment or doing that, and the city definitely is. Um, we do have to find a resolution, right, Mike? And this is a huge issue. 
Yeah, I'm all all open to conversation about all the the positive alternatives to it too. But some of the things you mentioned again, we can talk about this later. But some of the things you, that you mentioned, the negativities about that type of a setup, you know, let me just say that I know exist in in sanctioned public housing. Let's say, you know, so there. <laughs> Awesome. So it sounds like um, discussion about encampments and outreach is definitely something that we can um, be looking into deeper for future agenda items. Um, something for me personally, like I mentioned before, I'm a data person, so I really want to have a presentation from HMIS on the most uh, up-to-date information that we have. Um, I don't know if anyone can connect me with someone who they think would be able to discuss that and review that with us more. Um, Bernie, um, taking your head yes, which I love. <laughs> yeah, you you actually, our HMIS lead, um, Cheryl Lopez or, or Susana, I'm not sure, let me, I should know her last name by now. I've worked with her for years, um, are both, ladies and i don't know what their stipulations are around susana rodriguez um and so i can put their emails into the chat so that you can email them um they are you know open to being contacted um but there's just certain stipulations around what they can and cannot do of course you know i mean so um by all means i'm going to go ahead and put their stuff in here so you can have that Liz. And those would be the two people, Cheryl mainly, that you would contact there. She's the one that kind of makes those decisions or knows what committees that she has to take this before um, in order to get approval if need be to do stuff like this. So I don't know what the stipulations are around that. Um, okay. So I'll put Thank both you, Brandy. You're welcome. I don't know if this connects to it brandy but i know you've mentioned this before and i think this is someplace that something that really hasn't been looked at much it is this um you know the coordinated entry system and process uh i'm not one of these that says coordinated entry into housing and triage is a bad thing but the latest that i saw just kind of a cursory overview of it was in last year's report was that about half the people who were referred to housing uh, weren't even accepted by the agency they were referred to. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got this kind of weird system where at Old Pueblo, we're talking to someone who rates high enough to get into permanent housing, but we have to put them into a system. So some other agency might look for them and can't find them. And we've got them right in front of us. And then we're given a name of someone else across town that we can't find. And someone else is probably talking to them. And so this system, I think, really impacts the, the uh, access to housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it, it probably impacts unsheltered people even more. And unsheltered people are more likely to be people of color. And so it does, I think, have an equity connection. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Tom. And I think these are things that you were looking at. So in case nobody knows, Tom was my tutor in housing first. Ah for the whole first part of the my learning of it. I was old school back in the day, old Pueblo, where we did reentry, right? So you sobriety first and then housing. But um, through Tom, I learned all about my housing first. And this is part of the reason why I'm sitting in this chair today. So um, I think Tom's absolutely right about coordinated entry. And I think that we're doing a um, pilot. We're doing, we're doing an actual data collection in the background at the Wildcat about this. Um, you know, like I have a few people, BIPOC people, you know, literally native, um, an indigenous woman, um, a couple of black males um, that I'm actually following and saw that they had outstanding coordinated entry referrals from two years ago when we pulled them out of the Gulf Links encampment. One of the black individuals was given a re rapid rehousing referral and then it was declined. And the reason that it was declined was missing no contact. Well, we found him in the golf links encampment. So where's your outreach person um, not going out and finding this person in the ditch when you're signing up for a rapid rehousing program where you say you're gonna go find people, right? Or 
um, where that's part of the, the job, right? And I think this is the difference between some agencies and others where they will go out and find these people. So the, the, the number of black people, native, um, literally an indigenous woman, you know, an aborigine woman. Um, yeah, I mean, an aborigine woman also is there um, at our shelter and we pulled them all out of an encampment. Some of them have never even been touched by HMIS, which is interesting because what it took for us to do it was six weeks of engagement. Repeated, repeated, repeated engagement daily, every other day, daily, every daily going out there and saying, we're coming, we're, we're, we're getting the shelter ready for you. We're, we're here, here's some blankets, here's some water, here's some snack packs. Hi, we're here, we're here again. We're gonna come and get you. We are gonna come, we're, we're, we're really gonna come. You know what I mean? Engaging and, and knocking on these tents and going into their tent and seeing their living environment and bringing them the things that they said they needed. Um, and, you know, taking Narcan and Naloxone out there and, and just engaging with them daily for six weeks before we removed anybody from the encampment. So, and, and then that's when they say, okay, we'll go ahead and let you VI Spadat. So, I mean, Tom is right. Those populations that we're saying are not, are, are very underserved. We're seeing them at the wildcat, like literally because we just did not worry about coordinated entry, went straight to the encampment, pulled this 55 people out and into shelter right away, housing first, no preconditions, bring your stuff with you, we'll store it, we'll bed bug it, we'll bed bug tent it, whatever it takes. And then, so, so we're side by side doing this comparison with coordinated entry. And we have some of the minds that are like strict coordinated entry followers looking at like, well, maybe this system isn't so what we thought it was, right? Um, because, you know, Tom will be the first one to say, housing first is the person that's right in front of you going through a crisis right now. Not the person that you're, you can't even find that's in some queue in coordinated entry. It, it is them, but when they're, once they're right in front of you, you know what I mean? What, what good is it doing to turn the person that's right in front of you away when this person, you, you, you're not even locating this person right now? Or... Yeah. This person's already in housing and hasn't been closed out of the coordinated entry system, you know, and you're looking for this person while this person's suffering. So I totally agree there, Tom. Always have. Well, you've got good energy there. Well, yeah, yeah. when you're, when you're <laughs> it must seem very bizarre to the, to the homeless person, the user of the system, because you can screen for me and you've got housing, but you can't give me the housing. Someone else has to give it to me and you can't tell me what my score is and you can't, it's like, can someone just give me what I actually need? I, I don't need screenings. I need housing. Uh, it must seem really strange. It would be like trying to sell someone a car and then tell them, okay, now you need to go to another dealership to find it. Um, it, it makes no sense. Um, yeah. And usually when things You're don't totally, make any sense, it's good to get rid of it. Yeah. You're totally right, Tom. And Brittany, thank you so much for sharing the successes of that encampment intervention. Um, so I did email uh, the HMIS leads and I requested that they do two separate presentations, one on the pit hick data and another one on um, the coordinated entry system and um, any evaluation uh, metrics that they're using and any transitions that they might be making in the future or that they've recently made. Um, and Brandy, I see feed you in that. Uh, so if um, anyone has any other additional agenda items, don't hesitate to email me. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat. Uh, it sounds like we've got some great future agenda items coming up. Um, I did want to, as a point of order, bring one thing up, which is that Mayor and Council are going to be discussing um, utilities um, in the future and um, the uh, TEP efforts that I'm sure everyone has heard of because it's impossible not to hear of it. Um, and if anyone has any questions about that, I'm actually doing my master's thesis on um, development and uh, just general blight. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, does anyone have anything else that they'd like to bring up or can we adjourn? I move we adjourn. All right. 
we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. I hope you take care and have a good day. Um, our next meeting will be uh, the last Wednesday of next month, which is July 29th. Oh, July 27th at 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Brandy, Liz, Thank and Mike. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the info. Mike, if you need anything, feel free to reach out or I'd love to hear more of what you're doing. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Bye.